boundaries and a touch of wisdom, I hope. Much of my life has been, I think like many of our lives, a fascination with what is it that allows us to navigate the outer world, what are the boundaries that we must attend to, and what do we do if those boundaries start disappearing, which is to a great degree what's happening now. And for us, I believe it is always the question of where do we begin to essentially um, utilize wisdom in terms of our relationship to boundaries. And this is why wisdom tradition, my work on the tarot, has to do with what's called perennial wisdom tradition, meaning that if we begin to look at the world more like you would say in a dream structure, but a symbolical structure, we are not simply reacting to the characters and to the chaos, but we're starting to see that more like a weather condition, that these characters are arising almost symptomatically, a bit like that they're in response to the tides of chaos. But that doesn't define the day, so to speak. And this is where boundaries begin in the mental martial art of one's own mind, meaning what will I invest my energy in? And one of the great drains, as we know, is that we are so media-oriented, that but it's very surfacey. So it's it's chasing after things. It's it's if I got that. But if you think of like chasing shimmers on the shimmering water, you'd realize well, there's no there there, and so it leads to a greater emptiness, a greater hunger, a greater thirst. And this is what we see where individuals are incapable of stopping this almost carnivorous desire to have more, to have more, but. Inversely, that's also a great realization of emptiness. And I've also felt that there's a type of equation that, that the larger you need your expression to be by degree, there is a great emptiness that you are worried that will consume you. But if we have compassion for that rather than casting aspersions on that individual and begin to realize that all of the characters, the ones we like and the ones we don't like in the world, actually are an embodiment of a much larger conversation that isn't saying like a team, well, I'll take them on my team and I won't take them on my team. But actually, they're the reason why we are having to ask questions about boundaries. When you turn on television, you see people saying things that you realize shouldn't be said probably anything other than a confessional, but it's just shared and not realizing that, that part of who and what we are is like a container and that we can leak. And that when we do, we start to draw forth all sorts of unexpected and really undesirable consequences, a bit like a boat taking on water. We start spending most of our energy bailing rather than feeling that we are actually having a sense of direction. And part of my story and why my work returned us home in this question of, well, how do we, in a way, create boundaries where we live at least? You know, we all have the old expression, you know, a man's home is his castle. Well, what if it's more intimate? What if a, a man's home or a woman's home is their temple? Meaning it's where they actually say, these are the qualities I will value. This is the universe that makes me say yes, and I feel alive, and I look at the faces of those I love. I look at my pets, I look at my, the plants I'm growing, and I think, you know what, I like this part. I like this story. And I know everything else is going on. The world's a fire, in a sense. But is it really at my door? Because if it is, that's a different question. And the fire has been at my door, and that was a different conversation. But when it's not, and we always assume it is, to a great degree, we're living with an extended sense of ourself rather than an intimate sense of ourselves. And therefore we're feeling almost like you're defending a wall, like if they get through, I'm gonna collapse because there's really just a facade. And that's one of the questions and why the, the sense even of my mandala behind me, the sense of, well, can we find the center? Can we begin to realize almost like rings in a tree? If I begin with, well, this matters to me, and that's what happened with my discussion groups here. I realized in the politics of the 80s, it was moving toward image and acting, meaning it was a theater piece. But I said, maybe I can use my theater principles as a way of pulling back into the conversation of, if you don't like the worldly play, well, can you work on the play? at least with a group or groups of individuals that say, yeah, I'm, I'm discontented with that play, but I don't know what my life about my discontentment with that play. 
that I'm just shaking my hands and I realize at this point I'm being manipulated because I'm spending my life being angry rather than actually saying maybe I can participate. But I think one of the keys that happened for me was that I never had a grand conceit that it was meant to be anything big, that it was meant to be more than it was, but more of a custodial sense. If I can return my sense of the honoring of the human story back to at least the garden of my creation, then I'll leave a footprint in time that, that begins to not say that it was a matter of escaping anything or moving beyond one's own boundaries, but using limitation wisely and beginning to realize that freedom is not the doing away with limitation but the application, because it creates challenge and through the work, and this is one of the things we don't r recognize to a great degree, is that our greatest creative mentoring comes from the process and difficulty of finding the work, completing the work, whether it's, it's a woodworker working on wood, whether it's an actor working on a role or a painter on a painting or a, a construction worker working on a building. It doesn't just go up, it doesn't just happen. And I think that, that when we assume that that will happen, we then begin to give ourselves to a falsehood that maybe there's a shortcut. But what are we shortcutting from? For more leisure time to watch more TV? To be on the phone a bit more? If we think of, well, what is the invisible hand, essentially? What is it that at the end of our days, somebody says, well, did you do something? And we think of, well, yeah, I took the resistance and at least in my own way, tried to make something of it. I didn't take the resistance as a given. I took it as a way of bringing something to the table. And so maybe that's the whole question also with boundaries, is how do we bring something to the table? How do we not make boundaries, the imposition of boundaries and laws on other people, and really impose them on ourselves, and say that I will do what I can do within the context of where I live. And that's really all I can do. The rest, I'll have to look at like the great ocean that I'm on. I wish it was calm. Oftentimes it's not. But you know what? It's turned me into a good sailor. In other words, I know that life teaches adaptation. And if we understand ourselves, then we understand the vehicle we're in. And we wisely choose to not share everything. To not simply assume that what is in here should be spilled out there, but to a certain degree, to keep certain secrets secret, because it allows us to really engage in a deeper story that to be human is not really to figure one another out, nor to judge one another, but to finally realize that the radiance and the eye of another is the revelation, as they say, with namaste. I recognize the God within you.